The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. Lord, be on my mind, be on my lips, and in my heart. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask you. And he replied, What do you wish me to do for you? And they answered him, Grant that in your glory we may sit, one at your right, the other at your left. And Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Can you drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? And they said to him, We can. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right or my left is not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they became indignant at James and John. And so Jesus summoned them and said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them. And the great ones make their authority felt over them. But it shall not be so among you. Rather, whoever wishes to be great among you will be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you will be the slave of all. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The disciples and Jesus are on the road, they're on the way to Jerusalem, where Jesus is going to be handed over, crucified, and die. And for the third time now, Jesus prophesies predicts, tells his disciples that's what's going to happen. In the two verses just before this passage, Jesus does that. He describes he's going to die. Now, I don't know about you, but as I put myself in that scene and Jesus just poured his heart out, said, you know, they're going to kill me. I'm going to die. Like to your best friends. And then suddenly the best friends break out talking about who's more important and who's going to have the inheritance or the glory and the power. That hurts me. And I can't help but think how it hurt Jesus. Now, he can take it. He's God. But the story in Mark's gospel of these disciples, especially at this time, is just that bickering about worldly things while the salvation and the most important event in the most personal event, Jesus' life, death, and resurrection are going to happen. And it's, they don't understand. They don't understand that he's the Messiah. They don't understand that the Messiah was the Son of God or God. They don't understand why he would have to die or what ri- that he would possibly rise or what difference that would make and how that could bring about God's glory. And so it's easy for us and me, to look at those disciples and say, yeah, they just didn't get it. But you know what? I think, I think we don't get it either. Jesus has still given us the most personal and deep act of love. And we still think about ourselves, our own ambitions, go about our own ways, bickering amongst ourselves. And we don't get it either. And I hear a lot of conversations these days 
about, was Jesus really the Messiah? Do we know he's God? Why did he have to die? And many people deny these truths these days. And you people not included, of course. But many Christians can't even explain that kind of thing. Or just say the words, Jesus died for our sins. Jesus is God without really pondering those deep mysteries. And so I think it's helpful to review a little bit. Jesus was the Messiah. The disciples seem to understand that. But how do we know he's the Messiah? The biggest way we know he was the Messiah is what we hear in the first reading. It's a prophecy from Isaiah that the Messiah, the one who brings God's kingdom and the fullness of God's grace, forgiveness, and power, would come. Scholars will say that Jesus fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies. You've heard them. The Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, born of a virgin, from the line of David. Daniel prophet even prophesied that the Messiah would come during the Roman Empire. Not many people know that these days, but my friend Brant Petrie, my favorite theologian, will explain it to you. But that's why there is such an anticipation in Jesus' day. They expected the Messiah because it was prophesied. Christianity is the only religion in the history of the world that was announced beforehand by God. Isn't that powerful? It is to me. Why was that? God wanted us to know that it was real. He prophesied. Other religions, someone might have found enlightenment or a path and then say, hey, wow, look, and share it with others. Christianity isn't like that. Announced before him, planned from the beginning or planned from the fall and unfolded in history. Jesus is God. Many people will deny that nowadays and say, well, he was a good person. He really did exist, but he was a prophet. It was hard for the disciples to understand this also, but it's all over the Gospels. Many people will say that's not in the Gospels. But in John's Gospel, it's clear. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The Father and I are one. In chapter 8, they start to stone him for blasphemy. But even in the Synoptic Gospels, it's clear that Jesus is God in a different way. He forgives sins. And the Pharisees ask, who but God alone can forgive sins? He doesn't deny that he can forgive sins. He says, to prove to you I can forgive sins, get up, pick up your mat and walk to the lame, to the crippled. Jesus says, You've heard it said, and he quotes the Torah in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount. Then he doesn't say, and God says, he says, and I say to you. Only God can rewrite the Torah. He says he's the Lord of the Sabbath, given to us by God. Only God can say that. When he walked on the water to the disciples, he said, don't be afraid, it is I. That's the name revealed to Moses in the burning bush. And when he gets into the boat, the sea calms, which the Old Testament prophesies God does. His disciples worship him because they recognize that's God. And then in his trial, he's found guilty for blasphemy, claiming to be God. And so, Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is God. And as C.S. Lewis will say, you can't deny that even by logic. You can't just say Jesus is a good person or a great prophet because if that's true, he's either a lunatic who believes he's God or a liar or he's who he really says he is. But then the disciples and us too, why would God have to die? We, I, we hear it, God died for our sins. How does that save us? What does that make a difference? And I've heard it described in many ways. 
The first reading today kind of implies the sacrifice. The Jewish language was very clear about sacrifices for sin. And yes, we say Jesus was a sacrifice, but it's so easy to misinterpret that. The misinterpretation is that God is angry and has to have an infinite price to pay for our sins. God's not like that. We're saved in Jesus Christ in a much more beautiful, powerful, and profound way that I can't even fully describe. But you see, humanity sinned, left God, and being, leaving God out of our lives makes us more sinful, more selfish, more lost, and that hurt perpetuates one another as we inflict it on one another, and the world becomes lost. And so how does God change that? From up in heaven, he might give us instructions through the prophets, but that doesn't help. God comes into our world and joins himself to our humanity. God becomes human so we humans can then re-enter into the life of God. It is by the connection, the touch. And have you ever sat next to someone you truly felt in love with, who loved you? That heals you. And so God joins our humanity in a very real physical way to transform it. And he, the only then human who is sinless, dies and goes to heaven and then becomes a life-giving spirit for us. We, joined to his body, can share it also in his resurrection. And so the death of Jesus is really a consequence of the Incarnation. He joins our humanity in its entirety, birth, growing up, teaching, living, serving, and dying. Because he had to do the whole thing. And so we know that no matter what we go through, we have an advocate that's with us in every step of our life, even the most difficult. And his death, of course, was one of the most brutal because he who is truly good became the focus like a moth goes to light of all the evil trying to destroy him and prove that evil can win. But God's love overcomes that evil. He forgives us from the cross. All of us, not just the people then. He says, forgive them, they know not what they do. And lays down his life and love, absorbs all that hatred by his love. And in his resurrection then proves and shows us that love is more powerful than death. Love is more powerful than evil, and there's nothing in this world that can separate us from that love. And then what does he do further? He breathes his Holy Spirit upon us so that he now lives in us. This passage about, can you drink the cup that I drink from? Can you be baptized with the baptism I am baptized? He's referring to his death, his baptism, He's referring to the cup, God's will for him. But then he says to James and John and us, you will drink of the cup I drink, and you will share that baptism. He's talking about that we will follow God's will if we're his servants, and we must endure our death. But he's also talking about the sacrament of baptism that is instituted and the Eucharist, because that is how we share in his life, death, and resurrection, still made available to us. His baptism, that baptism, that Eucharist, is how God continues the incarnation in us, how he lives in us. But it's not magic either. We can receive this Eucharist and walk away hard-hearted, and it will have no effect on us. We can be baptized, and it has no effect on us unless we open our hearts to it. And that's the call of all of us today. You know, I hear it said a lot. I ask people, how is their faith? And they say, oh, I go to church all the time. Going to church won't save you. It's a necessary thing, but it alone won't save you. It's opening your heart to that salvation, acknowledging our sins and asking for God's forgiveness and pledging to do his will the spiritual principle that Jesus went through, death and resurrection, we must die to ourselves. We must not be like those disciples 
and think about our own gain and our own uh, power and prestige and our own agenda. We must be followers of Jesus who lay down his life for others and serve one another to reestablish the kingdom that was meant to be from the beginning of time, a kingdom of love and harmony and peace. And that's the kingdom Christ came to establish, not to overthrow governments. And so, today the invitation that those disciples missed is to recognize what God has done for us and to ask and open our hearts to that miracle (coughs) that he may live in us and that we may grow closer to him and that through his Holy Spirit living in us that we receive in this Eucharist and in our baptisms may then animate our actions, that we may die to self and give ourselves the service of his kingdom to be a servant of others in love and peace because love is more powerful than anything else in this world. Please pause right now. You who perhaps regularly receive the Eucharist, baptism, perhaps those who only occasionally do that, and open our hearts to God's saving power, his Holy Spirit, his love right now.